We aren't at home, obviously, and we have no plan for tonight, unfortunately. But what I think I'm going to do is start here at the uh, home of Johnny Vibes. I think we're going to do a quick little interview for his podcast. No, we do have a plan. The plan is, the plan is, is we, we do a podcast and we inspire the world. Inspire the world. And then you go on and make vlogs and, you know. We're making a vlog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is part of it. <laughs> this is the beginning of that vlog. Uh, <laughs> after this, I'm going to head to the, um... Maybe we... we do I go to the Concord? No, we throw some clips in from Embrace the Grind podcast to get them hype. Maybe some sound bites of you, like, ripping other vloggers apart. Or, you know, ranting a little bit here and there. B-roll going right here. Dropping clips right now. Doing it. I can do that. <laughs> you, know what you'd do? you know what you'd be good at? Uh, Vlogging. <laughs> Right. We're gonna do the podcast, and then the next time you guys see me, it'll probably be me heading to most likely the encore. We're gonna get some uh, cash game action in tonight. <sighs> Wish me luck. You have a voiceover voice that's different than your like real life voice. I've heard that before. Yeah, I've heard that, and I, I don't know what I do during the voiceovers, but I've heard a lot of people say like, "You don't sound like you sound the same, but it's like a different cadence or a different yeah. something to it." Yeah. But it's not conscious. Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. That is a wrap for the uh, Embrace the Grind interview with uh, this guy, Mr. Jonathan Vibrations. We have, we have some hot takes. We have some really hot takes. This is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how you cut this together and what, you, uh, what hits the cutting room floor. It's going to be really interested, interesting to see if I'm canceled after this. Well, it was an hour and a half talk, so we have some room to work with. You know? I don't have to <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to get out of here. Um... I think it is Encore. I think I'm heading to Encore. Good luck, bro. <sighs> Thanks, man. I'm going to need it. I'm going to need the luck. Uh, oh, you don't need the luck. Come on. I'm going to need something. It's all right. Next time you guys see me, Encore it is. Thanks for having me, sir. Of course. Always love having my man, my main man, Jamin Burton. Can't wait for the mid-session update of this vlog. I'll be tuned in. Drop a comment. Hit a like. Maybe subscribe, notify <laughs> if you really love the man. You guys remember him, right? Ex YouTube sensation, Johnny Vibes. <laughs> <laughs>
His pre-flop click back to $40 off of his $450 stack screams, I want to see some action, but more importantly, I want to see a safe flop so I can really start betting. I do happen to have a hand that can break his little heart, and for 20 more dollars, I'll take a shot at it. I call as does the the under-the-gun one player who is now getting insane odds with whatever he's holding. Ten of spades, nine of spades, seven of diamonds. Damn, this flop is so close. As expected, the small blind overbets the flop by sliding $150 into the middle. Although that flop is sexy as hell for my exact hand, there isn't much I can do, especially with a player behind me that most likely has a hand in the same class as mine. Even if I do call here, getting the wrong price, the under the gun one player could just shove, and then I'm really screwed. Best to just let this one go. And the under the gun one player follows suit. To no one's surprise, the small blind shows us two aces. This game was tight, really tight, and in games like this I sometimes get a little wonky with my preflop decisions. Sometimes it's out of boredom, sometimes out of the whole I'm just going to outplay them post-flop ego thing, and sometimes just because I want to see what happens. This hand is probably a third of all three. Under the gun opens to $15 and I find the call on the button with 8-6 offsuit. I know, I know, not a hand to be calling with here. But you know that boredom slash ego slash let's just see combo is strong sometimes. The big blind comes along for the ride and we see it flop three ways. Deuce, four, seven, rainbow. The big blind checks, the under the gun player checks, and with a gut shot and eight high here, I'm sort of ambivalent about the whole thing. I mentally land on check and we see a turn. The six of hearts turn improves my gut shot to a pair, and when the big blind now leads for $30 and the original razor folds, I come along. The eight of spades river improves my single pair to two pair, and if the big blind bets, I'm not folding. But he checks. I have two pair versus an opponent that should have a lot, I mean a ton, of different fives in their range. In hindsight, I should probably check back here as I'm not going to get value from a single paired hand. I can't beat 8-7, and though I block sets, I don't see them folding here either. One liner be damned. My game time decision though was to bet, and to make that bet look like $75. The big blind most likely had something as he tanked for 20 seconds before letting it go. As the game progressed, I began taking more and more bluffing opportunities because villains really just weren't fighting back. Some of them worked, some didn't, but what was quickly becoming apparent was that people just didn't believe me, and I was getting called down really light. Which is great, if I ever luck into making an actual hand. Here the cutoff limps, I raise it to $30 on the button, and the big blind chooses to just call. The big blind is definitely in an awkward spot to find a flat call in, because the limping cutoff still has the ability to act, And with the button being the widest of positions, the cutoff can often just re-raise here quite liberally. This time though, the cutoff just folds and we see this flop heads up. King, nine, five, rainbow. The big blind leads with a check and with middle pair, I do the same. The turn six of diamonds puts two diamonds on the board and the big blind checks again. 
With the Ace of Diamond in my hand, I'm not too worried about flush draws, and I don't really have a hand that I can normally get two streets of value from. So I mentally flip a coin and land on check. We're off to the river. The River Seven of Clubs makes this board really straighty. Is that a word? You know what I mean. The big blind checks again. Well, I check the turn to get value on the river, and lo and behold, we are on said river. I don't expect a king or pocket tens to check all three streets. My hand looks weak as hell, so I wouldn't expect the straight or two pair to check the river, hoping I would suddenly bet, so I most likely have way the best hand. I bet $30 into this pot, and although there is some tanking, it doesn't take too long before the big blind looks me up. Nine. I say nine and table my hand. She tables queen jack offsuit for queen high, and I pull this one in. In this hand, we open king ten of spades from under the gun, and an older gentleman from the cutoff finds the call. A few things I know about this guy. He doesn't play like your typical OMC type. He's been in there mixing it up a bit with some non-standard holdings. I think he interprets checks as weakness and is likely to bet when checked to. And I think he's overfolding, meaning he doesn't really like to continue when faced with aggression. Heads up, we see the queen of clubs, nine of spades, deuce of spades flop, and with me out of position, I'm not going to have many leads here. I check. As if on cue, he fires $35 into the pot. I expected this, so now it's time to just deduce how my range fares against this board and his bet size. In this spot, I can pretty much do anything except fold. Folding would be pretty horrid. My exact hand has a ton of equity, and the range of hands that I'd be opening under the gun with are really strong. I could have a set of queens here for all he knows. Couple that with the fact that I think he overfolds, and we find a check raise to $160. He has $1,200 behind, and if he's thinking about calling this, he might as well consider calling the next two streets too, because this story I'm starting to weave has no breaks. It might get expensive. He decides his best option is to fold, and we take this one down. Another hand that's opened with a limp. We like to raise it up to $30 on the button with 4-3 of spades, and very similar to a hand I discussed a few minutes ago, the big blind finds a flat and ends up sandwiched between the razor, me, and the opening action, the hijack. Unlike the previous hand, however, this time the opener calls and we see this flop three ways. Right away, with the big blind flatting, her range most likely isn't too strong. I don't expect big pocket pairs or big suited anythings. If I had to guess, I'd guess there's a lot of marginal hands in there. And a few pocket pairs. The hijack, limp calling is a ton of pocket pairs, like a billion of them. We see a flop of king 4-7 with two diamonds and the action is checked to me. With my newly found pair of fours, I check it back. The turn pairs the seven and action is checked to me again. Now it's time to protect my equity against hands like 10-9 suited, ace-10 off, random flush draws, etc. I bet $45 fully expecting to get looked up by pocket pairs and maybe some flush draws. Maybe. My hand is pretty garbage, and I can easily find a fold if raised. It doesn't come to that though. They both quickly release. The old uh, mid-session update at the Encore. Man, it feels like a while since I've been here. <sighs> what can I say about the game I'm in now? Actually, I'll say this about this game, and I'll say this about uh, a lot of games here in Vegas post-World Series. They're kind of garbage, a little bit. The action is a little slower now that the World Series is over. There's obviously a greater population of regs than there are tourists. And um, there's just like a poker drought going on. It's like a live cash game drought. And it has affected my game tonight. It affected my game the other night. And I think it'll probably affect games here for the next month or so. 
So what do I do to combat this post-World Series cash game drought? Especially like my game tonight, there's no action. There's no action post-flop unless somebody has top pair plus. So you know what I do? I'm bluffing a lot. It's just what I'm doing. Uh, I'm really not making a lot of hands. Um, so we just bluff. We just make sure we don't get to the river. <laughs> that's, that's, that's basically it. Uh, and actually, as you can tell, I'm already heading back in because that's the entire mid-session update. I have nothing else to say uh, about my session. Encore's great. Encore's always great. Great ambiance. Room feels great. It's just, um, you know, World Series is over. So a little less action than I have been used to for the last few months. But we'll persevere. We'll get through. We'll get through. so many seeds to sow when the harvest comes in it will be time to share what we have grown we were having the time of our lives when we started everything was grooving but i'm noticing lately we've been half-hearted west side story don't spent the bulk of our days feeling free like we were properly stoned till you liked everything but the likes of me i can't help but recall we were having the time of our lives when we started everything was grooving but i'm noticing later Started. Everything was grooving, but I'm noticing lately we've been half-hearted. West Side Story don't feel pretty anymore. We were having the time of our lives when we started. Everything was grooving, but I'm noticing lately we've been half-hearted. West Side Story. As you can see from the footage thus far, the table was playing pretty tight and passive. Calling was definitely the preferred action over raising with anything but the nuts. As such, I began opening in most positions a bit more liberally than usual. Here we find an open of $20 with 6-5 offsuit and the button calls. Heads up, we see a flop of King of Diamonds, Jack of Hearts, 10 of Clubs, and out of position, I check. The button decides not to stab at this pot and checks behind. The Queen of Diamonds turn signals that it's go time. Either our villain has an ace or he doesn't, but I have six high and almost no chance to win without betting. We lead this turn for $25 and happily take this small one down. Not much to see here. 
On the left, we win about $100 with King-10 offsuit after flopping top pair, betting flop, and then betting enough to put our opponent all in on the turn. And on the right, we lose about the same amount over a couple hands, dancing around in the streets with pocket deuces and pocket fives. Poker is weird that way. As the session is winding down, we stumble upon a situation that I alluded to earlier in the vlog. This hand demonstrates why it's really, really treacherous finding cold calls out of position. The under the gun player opens to $20 off of a really short stack and I put in a 3 bet to $65 with pocket queens from under the gun 1. When action falls to the big blind, he decides to cold call my $65 raise. This isn't really a thing and it happened a lot in this game. Don't get me wrong, there are rare situations where cold calling a 3 bet does exist. Like let's say the big blind has aces, the stack depths are allow it, and the big blind is also so well versed that he can balance his 3 bet cold calling range with garbage hands too. So that it's not always apparent that he has aces. In a live 2-5 game, that's not happening. Action is now back on the original razor and he just shoves for $137. Now it's my turn to act, and I realize that the big blind's cold call was most likely atrocious. So we want to punish him. I make it $275, and the big blind tanks for almost 50 seconds and decides to call again. The big blind is now extremely capped. Knowing the field, the best possible hand he has is most likely pocket jacks. And he's in a horrible spot, playing a hand out of position in a 5-bet pot preflop with a capped range. A recipe for disaster. Heads up, with a protected main pot, we see a flop of queen of clubs, four of clubs, ten of spades. The big blind checks, and although I have top set, it doesn't really matter. I'd be betting aces, kings, ace king, ace queen, ace five suited, etc. For all about the same amount, $150. Whatever the big blind was looking for on that flop, he didn't find it and releases his hand. I table my queens as we see the five of diamonds hit the turn, followed by the jack of spades. Seconds later, the under the gun player also mucks, and I pull in a pot that's bigger than it probably should have been. We stayed um, probably about two hours longer than we should have stayed. It is, I don't know, three in the morning. It is time to go home. And um, like I said during the mid-session update, the game was kind of, mm, mm. I could have left two hours ago. But let's get to the nitty gritty. Um, in the game for 1500, out for uh, 2097. 2097, because I gave her $3 and she gave me 2100. So up about 600 bucks, which is 600 bucks. With the run of sessions that I have been having lately, some you have seen, some you have not, I will happily take the 600 bucks and march my merry ass home. I know I will not be playing this weekend. I have a lot of editing and uh, some other things in store. So, so let's go ahead and wrap this thing up so I can go home. If you like the vlogs, like the vlogs, leave me a comment. I will probably respond eventually. And uh, subscribe, subscribe to this channel, subscribe to my new Fear the Drawing Dead channel, subscribe to all the things, and I will see you, I don't know, mid-August-ish? Have a good night. Bye. I can't lie, I like that little, that little cart thing.
and I am about half interested in playing poker today. That's the plan. If the game stays good though, we'll be here all damn night. All damn night. Hot, hot, hot. Let's wrap this thing up before I uh, melt to death. Y'all want to see all the outtakes, fun facts, and behind the scenes craziness? Well, here we go. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'll tell you what I'm doing. Um, there's... It's been a minute since I played 2-5 at the Encore. My choices of late would be to play 5-10 at the Bellagio. However, after some running bad and me just wanting a change of scenery, I decided to head there. With the run of uh, sessions I've been having lately, some of you've seen, some of them, you know, fear the drawing dead. So you're on. So you get in on the ground floor before it blows up. Gonna give you guys an extra little fun fact about tonight's session at the Encore. Um, this vlog probably started with me doing the Embrace the Grind podcast at uh, Johnny Vibes' crib, and then I came to the Encore. But what you don't know is I really came to the Encore last night. Uh, came here, played for like two hours, left up like 300 bucks, but the game was garbage. I didn't get any good footage. So I know it's coming back to the Encore tonight, so I kind of just molded the footage together. So it probably looks like I just left Johnny Vibes' place a couple hours ago, but really, that was last night. Fun facts!